right, welcome everyone. We're Semblance of Sanity. I'm Caleb. I'm Jacob. And we're here for podcast number, number 39. 39. We're talking about the antagonist origin story. Yes, this was uh, voted on by our antagonist ascendancy over in Discord. Yes, they con- won. Maybe congratulations. Yes. They won the May Madness events. Uh, it quite soundly defeated yes. everyone else. Yes, uh, mm-hmm. did did quite well in a lot of specific events that gave them the the definite uh, oh, lead yeah. in terms of points. They went but, uh, above and beyond. Yes, we presented them with a lot of antagonist themed uh, podcast discussion topics, nice. and this was the one they chose. Yep. And the antagonist uh, origin story is a is a very curious kind of thing because in right. a lot of ways. It's very similar to the protagonist's origin story. Exactly. But it's also not necessarily as often presented in stories. Right. There are some differences that, that definitely need to be need to be covered. But before we get into that, mm-hmm. we can talk about why an origin story is just so important in general. Yes. Um, because you, you need it. It it's it provides so much context for like and grounding basically for a character so that mm-hmm. even if it's say an antagonist and you don't actively root for them but some of the best ones can make you root for them right um it'll make you sympathize with them understand them have a connection with them so you care about what happens to them even if maybe plot wise you still don't want them to win right the main thing that needs to be remembered just like every other character in a story is that they are a character right you need to have the audience connect with them at some level Mm -hmm. one of the things that's really prominent in every single proper antagonist out there villainous or maybe more anti-hero antagonist is that the audience on some level finds that point with them that they resonate it might just be how cool they are it like it might sure. have nothing to do with whether or not what they're doing they believe mm-hmm. in in some way or just that the heroes seem to be really bland and yay they're fighting against them <laughs> yeah exactly so what we're going to cover here are kind of a, a couple things that we think makes a good uh, antagonist's uh, origin story, right. but also why having an antagonist origin story should be used and when it really shouldn't be used. Exactly. So uh, specifically, we're going to talk about a couple a uh, couple stories. Mm-hmm. Uh, before we get into that, I have to give a shout out to one of our VIP patrons. Oh, uh, yes. Shout out to that one Gav, as he is one of the uh, VIPs in mm-hmm. the Antagonist Ascendancy. Yes. Thank you so much for your support, dude. You're you, awesome. You were insane. Sane during the madness, just <laughs> getting racking up all the points. Yeah, I, I showed Jacob a lot of your 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 things you did, your little accomplishments and stuff. So, well yeah. done, well done, well done. All right. Uh, so in particular, these stories are ones that are, I'd say, really present in people's minds right now. Yeah. Uh, one of them is a classic villain story that most everyone, at least in the U.S., knows about, and then another one that's made kind of. Uh, a big splash. It's much more recent. Yeah, yeah. But it's really good. And let's let's talk about that one real mm-hmm. quick because I think there's a lot uh, there's a lot of very simple things to grab from it and right. how to do an antagonist origin story really well, well. Yeah. really well. And that's from the story of Black Panther. Mm-hmm. Now this is a recent Marvel movie that came out. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you go it's watch it. Really good, really good. But one of the things that made it so good was that it had probably the best antagonist in, in the Marvel. Marvel Cinematic Universe. Up till that point. Yeah, up till that point. Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, he gives Thanos a run for his he money. Does. He does. He does. Yes. In this character, uh, Killmonger, Killmonger. Uh, that's his, his moniker mm-hmm. during the, uh, the movie, during the, movie and the yeah. story and stuff. But it's also something that, get, that betrays a little bit of... Of sim- like it, it makes the character seem a little bit more simplistic just by the right. name. But when you get into actually why this mm-hmm. character wants to do what they do, it's a lot more complicated. Yep, yep. And they at the beginning, you're like, okay, so this is obviously, you know, this is this is the bad guy, right? Right. He's the rival, exactly. But then he starts actually talking about why he's doing this, and even though you're like, okay, you're doing some messed up stuff, you're like, all right, this guy has motivation behind it, even right. if I don't agree or you know really sympathize yet. But when the origin story comes around, mm-hmm. it is one that is super simple. It doesn't do anything really complicated. Mm-hmm. But, oh, It gets the message boy. across. It gets the now, message across. what Jacob touched upon right there in the beginning is that the motivation of the antagonist is brought to the forefront really quickly. Mm-hmm. Now, the thing is, the uh, motivation is veiled. Right. It's not all fully on display. One yep. of the things that's best done in a simple story with an antagonist 
is you bring the audience through an arc of sorts with mm -hmm. understanding the motivations right. of the antagonist. So you have them in the forefront very quickly so that they're like, okay, I know what this character's about, but I don't know why they are the way they are exactly. now. Because with antagonists, usually they end up doing some pretty drastic things, and you want to be able to understand how did they get here? Because if you can't understand that, then they feel less like a person and more just like a, a plot device. <laughs> a plot device of chaos, basically. Exactly. They come in and they just wreck the plot so, so that, that the hero, hero can, can react to it. Yeah. Now this is way more prominent in superhero stories. Yes. That's why we're bringing up a superhero story in the beginning. Mm -hmm. We're going to go into a little bit more of a tragic a kind, kind of drama uh, antagonist uh -huh. in the in the in the next one here. Yeah. But uh, in particular, that's kind of why the origin story is important, mm -hmm. is that it needs to provide context to the motivation. Right. In Black Panther, the origin story does an exceptional job yes. at portraying yeah. the context for the motivation. Right. One of the clever things Black Panther also does is it splits up the origin story into multiple scenes uh -huh. so that you're not getting the full picture immediately and it causes you to ask questions. Exactly. Whenever you're asking questions about a character that's because a you're thing. interested, right. that's a good thing. Yeah. Like, and, yeah. That's, that's what you want in every single character and you make. And here's the other thing. They tied it into the main like plot of the story with the main character and all that stuff so that, that when they go into the origin story... Mm -hmm. It feels like there's a reason to it. It's not right. just, okay, and now let's show you something tragic that basically got this hero, this anti-hero villain, whatever, where they are today. Right. It has grounding. So you're like, okay, there's there's a reason why, why like, say, they are antagonistic to the hero in particular. Right. right. That was something that Black Panther did very well. Yes. In the beginning, they show a little bit of a flashback, and you don't really have any context as to exactly. why you're getting this... What you can tell is a flashback, mm -hmm. but because this was a new story uh, with some of the characters being uh, recurring from Civil War, but some of them you're like, I don't, I don't know any of these people yet. Right. You needed to make sure that you didn't uh, show your hand too early. And mm -hmm. this is what we wanted to talk about was next, was that generally the protagonist origin story happens before the antagonist origin yes. story. And this is important. A lot of simple hero's journey stories will have the whole story be about the hero mm -hmm. and therefore the origin story of course is going to happen before because there is right. no antagonist origin story exactly an antagonist origin story doesn't need to happen 100 uh -huh. percent of the time and in the case of black panther they were able to do this super well and not have it seem strange because we had already been introduced to mm -hmm. the character of black panther t'challa t'challa yeah. yep. in uh captain america civil war right which opened up a lot of options for them yeah, a, a lot of things in stories where the protagonist has already been established allows for actually a lot more focus to be given to the one who's kind of shaking the plot and right. moving things forward. Yeah. In this case, uh, Killmonger's mm -hmm. character in Black Panther. So right. when they give the proper context later, mm -hmm. you're then able to establish an even stronger connection with the character yeah, exactly. than if you just gave them the motivations based on the things that they said or the things that they did right. uh, up to that point. Now, when an antagonist origin story is revealed, one of the worst things you can do is to basically change the motivations right. almost completely yeah. based around this new information for yeah. the sake of plot twists. Because usually with antagonists, since you want their motivations to be clear up front but not mm. understand necessarily why... why? The origin story will usually go towards the end, and then it provides yep. context, and you're like, ah, I understand now, right? And right. that's what it should do, so you'll also want it to be more concise and things like that. Yeah. Because you don't have as much time to spend on the antagonist as the protagonist. Generally, that's just how it works. Right. And remember, this is a general kind of Right. There's, uh, there's thing. exceptions there's, there's to all, every There's rule. exceptions to all of this, yeah. but the main thing that should be communicated is that if the antagonist's motivations drastically change from what you've seen to the origin story, what it reveals there, you're then left with this thing of, wait, but I still don't understand how they got from that place to this place. There's right. no connective tissue. Yeah. A great example of that having a little bit of problems was uh, Legend of Korra. Uh, oh. You have Amon mm -hmm. who starts off with this really great character, right. and then they go into the origin story, and you're like, whoa, this is really intense, but wait, how do we get from there to here 
some character mm-hmm. gives a line of exposition that's supposed to explain it. It's like, well, right. that doesn't work 100% yeah. of the time. That's why a lot more people identified with Tarlock's character than they did exactly. with Exactly. Uh, because Mon's character. because the origin story is to is supposed to provide emotional connection, not necessarily plot connection. Right. That's why for the protagonist it's done usually at the beginning yep. so that way you're on board with their story. Because it the, does give plot connection. Right. It does give plot connection. With the antagonist because you've been going against them this entire time mm-hmm. they save that for the end for that little that little last punch. Right. Right. And it, when we say the end, we don't mean the, the very, very end, end, but we mean anything in the essential like act three exactly, portion right. of stories. Because generally act one sets up the characters, mm-hmm. brings about the introductions, and introduces the plot conflict hook. The second one is having basically the temporary the climax slash mm-hmm. uh, conflict kind yeah. of just stuff in the middle. The second half, the second act can be kind of tricky in a lot of ways it because can of be. that. But yeah. then in the third act, you can have all the stuff come to a head. Right. And in the case of Black Panther, they did that because you already knew his motivation and they gave the emotional connection with, okay, minor spoilers, well, spoilers for Black Panther. Um, but the whole idea of, oh, they killed his dad, that random kid that you saw that you didn't mm-hmm. understand who it was and you thought that was just, okay, just, oh yeah, they're, you know, they're, they're just kids, you know, playing basketball shooting hoops and then it's like oh no they they killed his dad yep. and that that line of or they also left him there and they left him there yeah, yeah yeah they didn't take him with him they didn't say hey your dad was doing some bad stuff he tried to kill one of us we had to we do just this left with no but hey but hey we'll take you with us and take care of you and we're so sorry this had to happen yep. they tried to cover it up in, in a lot of ways one of the things that can be done to a great effect with the antagonist origin story is it gets you to question the protagonist a little exactly. bit. Exactly. A lot of times in stories to bring about some level of nuance is they'll make the message of the protagonist and the antagonist be equal in measure. There is no rule about this. You do not have to have the protagonist message always ring true, mm-hmm. like, you know, more so than the antagonist. You can have it be both sides. You can have it be perfectly balanced. You can have it be gray enough to exactly. where you're like unable to tell if it's balanced or not or have it be like they're they're so right but then they they just get that one thing wrong where they're gonna do something and it's like i can't let you do that thing even if you're right about everything else yeah that has to be stopped yeah a a lot of ways that uh people have grown to kind of appreciate nuance in characters is basically how much discussion can be had with people after the story has been consumed you know, thinking like, wait, so who who was yeah. in the right there? What? Uh-huh. And Black Panther handles that exceptionally well, so Very we well. highly recommend that you go check it out if you yep. haven't yet. The next story that we're going to go into... Before we get oh, into that, we get into that, there's just one line that from Black Panther oh, that, yes, that I bring feel up this summarizes line. Yes. the whole origin story because origin stories are about forming an emotional connection, right? Yep. And at the end of all of this, mm-hmm. when Killmonger is lying there, dying, you know, and he just says, can you imagine that? kid from brooklyn grown up believing in fairy tales Mm. and it's like whoa Whoa. like if you did not sympathize with this guy already Mm -hmm. that because the thing is that's not tied to some plot thing it's not something where you can quantify Mm -hmm. it and say whether it's like objectively right or wrong but it's the idea that it's something that he felt and that's just like oh my god yeah (laughs) (laughs) oh (sighs) good character good stuff um Next story we're going to be bringing up, though, is one that a lot of you are very familiar with. Yeah. And a lot of you have very skewed opinions on And We're not going to really go into, like, too much in detail. We're going mm. to kind of touch upon the things that they tried to do in this story, the things that they succeeded in. And the things, the things that, that they, they didn't They, they could have at. done better at. Yeah. And this is talking about Star Wars mm-hmm. and the origin story of Darth Vader. Yeah. Probably... Considered by many to be one of the greatest antagonists slash villains oh, yeah. of all time. And if you think about it, they kind of did give an origin story a little bit in, like, The Return of the Jedi and things like that. You know, right. those talks with Luke. But then they go in to actually give it in depth. In depth. And that um, moment when you realize that the prequels were kind of a rough, poorly executed origin story. origin story for Anakin. Right. And you didn't resonate yeah. with the character nearly as much as George Lucas right. wanted you to by the end of it. Because what it was focusing on was mainly focusing on plot type stuff mm-hmm. to see how it makes sense that this person would turn into Darth Vader. Right. But what it didn't really do was give you much to um, sympathize with him. To basically make you root for him and be like I love this character that way it hurts when you, it's like ah oh, but yes. he's going to turn into Darth Vader. Right. right. There's a Shakespearean kind of Greek tragedy aspect to mm-hmm. it 
where you realize that it's all fated to happen because you've exactly. seen this before. But right. cleverly, in a, in a, I would say in a, in a very genius method, by having it be a prequel, mm -hmm. you know, it happens yeah. after the original right. stuff. Mm -hmm. You're having the origin story come after the protagonist's yes. origin story, which is kind of clever because then that makes Anakin's story in the prequels be a fallen protagonist story, not necessarily an antagonist origin story. Right. So what I get that George Lucas was trying to do was to create a nuanced character that's wrestling between the dark and the light, and it's exemplified with the Force having right. a dark side and a light side. Yeah. And so, you know how it's going to end. Yeah, so yeah. on that aspect, that's great. What he flubbed in was in a whole lot of the execution. Right. A making whole us, lot. Like, making us actually care about this character before Darth Vader. Because even with Darth Vader, all the stuff in Return of the Jedi, the, you know, let me look on you with my own eyes. Yeah. Right? Just once. Yeah. That's great stuff. That's, that's that stuff. shows us the humanity. That makes us sympathize, right? Right. But... You know, maybe make them have a bit more redeeming characteristics when you go back and show where they begin. Right. Well, part of that happens to be with the uh, the the, fi the fact that when <laughs> when we find out why the motivate what motivations led Anakin to become Darth Vader, mm -hmm. we don't look at them and go, "Those are horrible motivations." We look at them and go, "And that's how they chose to portray the motivation." Exactly. So the idea that his wife is mm -hmm. going to die and there's nothing he can do right. about it as a jedi like and someone tempts him with the whole uh -huh. ah i can help you save your loved ones that's that's, that's good that's full metal alchemist brotherhood yes. stuff you yes. know that's that's human transmutation type deal mm -hmm. that can be amazing yes but but <laughs> but if you're going to execute it in these methods you end up losing all the potential power that mm -hmm. comes with the uh right. Basically, yeah. with that style. And here's another thing that I would say was one of the big mistakes that they made. Because they went into so much detail with it, yes. another reason why the yes. origin story for villains in, or antagonists in particular should be kept short and concise Very is efficient. because no matter what, you won't really, you'll, there will still be the disconnect of where they got to is a twisted place that I cannot really identify with as much. You can sympathize, but yes. you still say they got to a twisted place, right? The fact that we got to see Anakin be like, oh, okay, I need to save my wife. You know, if that means dark, you know, dark ritual, whatever stuff that Palpatine's going to show me, I'm okay with that. Hey, that we can be on board with that, even if maybe the acting and the dialogue could have been a bit better. <laughs> but once it's like, all right, from there, I guess I killed Mace Windu and now I'll do whatever you say. And he says, all right, go slaughter children and stuff like that. That's like, we didn't see any conflict with that. They could have made it a, bun a bunch better if they basically had Anakin be like, if, is that, if that's what it takes, you know, that just, that would have made us be a lot more grounded with a it. A lot because, of that, a lot of that is the mm -hmm. acting. A lot of that is the fact that they were rushed to make this go a mm -hmm. specific way. But when I go back and look at what the fans have kind of come up with as alternative ways that they could have had mm -hmm. this whole origin story done one of the main things that you see is that they take a lot of the focus and bring it into the emotional context mm -hmm. of anakin's character right. specifically in a lot of ways tied to obi-wan kenobi and you can see where they tried to do that in revenge of the sith with this yeah. cringy whole little you're with obi-wan oh. aren't oh. you you turned her <laughs> against me well, yes. and it's like and that's, oh my that's, god and that's like, horrible but then you have the parts where he's just looking across at, at yes. you know, the, the senate building or whatever that's and the it's good like, stuff and that's the good stuff right that's the good stuff but that was such a small bit and it was too little yeah. too late and you know and all that so in a lot of ways the origin story should have either been the entire thing you know, in that right. we wouldn't have had all this other stuff shoved in there as well. Or made it a lot shorter, a lot, a shorter. lot more compact, yep. and made it less about Anakin throughout the whole mm -hmm. thing and had Anakin be more of a a right. kind of a small bit of the yep. whole thing so that it kind of comes out like, of it, a small yep. tragedy or a small mistake. Or like, a small imagine, imagine for a second there. if they did some montage of showing Anakin being the hero. We didn't have to have all the complaining stuff and all that crap, mm -hmm. right? Just a montage of him being a hero. Then he finds out his wife's going to die. Then we have Palpatine saying, there's a way to save her. And then we basically cut to Anakin having that, that look, you know, that staring bit. And then him cutting off Mace Windu's hand and Palpatine saying, all right, now follow me and I'll show you. But, you know, 
start by killing all these it's, people. Basically, that that just yeah. by itself would have been yeah. enough. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of ways in which we could have like had a had a much better origin story uh-huh. with this. But the main thing that we get from the differences between you know Killmonger and say Anakin's origin story is that Anakin's origin story had way too much in there when mm-hmm. we could have just had things left to the imagination, which yep. is ultimately in a lot of ways better right because then they'll fill the in whatever they want to be there the most and, and and in some ways people could say that's that's lazy writing you should go into detail and stuff i i would say no in a, in a lot of ways the yeah. reader's imagination is already engaged so much because mm-hmm. these characters you know you know they they make that right. that that environment p- mm-hmm. possible that you don't want to give them everything you want to have them exactly. ask questions yep and that's what black panther did that's what Anakin's didn't. Right. They removed a lot of the potential questions in there mm-hmm. by replacing them with really bad answers. Yeah. So, uh, be efficient, be focused, mm-hmm. uh, have the whole thing being about proper context for the motivations, right. which is something that's actually a little bit interesting. You could say that actually one of the reasons why mm-hmm. the disconnect between Anakin and Vader happened is because when Vader is introduced in you uh-huh. know, the original trilogy... He doesn't have an actual motivation until Luke is brought into the whole uh, story. That's what makes Empire oh. Strikes Back in a lot of ways so good is because we get to see the villain invader and exactly. that his motivations are yeah. to right. take over mm-hmm. the Emperor's spot with yep. his son. Right. That yeah. is really compelling. Mm-hmm. But when you think about when they try to bring that in with Anakin, right. he's like, Padme, we can rule the galaxy. And it's like, it's like one, it's delivered just... Badly, but two, there's no reasoning behind it because okay, even if you can't identify with the emotion, it should be some kind of emotionally based thing that's happening, right? right? But even if you can't identify with the emotion, if you communicate it effectively so that the person that has the emotion holds it so strongly that even if you don't agree, you can at least feel that they believe it, yeah, then that can be enough. That can be all the anchor you need. In a lot of ways, this is actually where anime beats live action in a lot of ways. Because the vision of the original creator gets through to the... Uh, the audience better because there's less mediums in between. Right. They can there's, build it frame there's by just, frame. There's just one voice actor and whatever mm-hmm. is drawn slash animated. You don't yep. need to think about what the actor ate that day. <laughs> because exactly. you can just say, do like another right. voice take yep, or something. Yep, exactly. You don't have, there's, there, it's not expensive to do, a, like nearly as expensive to do a retake because it's just doing a bunch of different voices. Say the thing again. Figuring out which one fits the best. You know? Right. You can say it 40 times. You can edit yeah. it in post. You can do all these other things right. in there. But in the end with like Anakin, with like Hayden mm-hmm. Christensen, I'm sorry, but like you're kind of stuck with what you got and however right. the director does things there. So right. that that's a little bit there. But mm-hmm. origin stories for the antagonists yes. don't need to happen. But if you do have <laughs> one, Make sure it gives context. It's done effic- efficiently. Uh huh. And sorry, what were you gonna say? Oh yeah, yeah. No, no. Keep going. Keep going. Just... Okay, it's done. Done efficiently. It's done at the later parts in the story to give right. proper context, and it provides a connection point from the character to the audience mm-hmm. in such a way that uh, gives the antagonist's uh, whole story uh, weight. Right. And one of the thing, one of the other things I would say that you can, that is one of the powerful things you can do with an origin story is if there's ever a situation where who the antagonist is is unclear, mm-hmm. then you can reveal that and then immediately give the origin story to explain why. One of the great examples mm. for this, I would say, is with okay. the Disappearance movie, The Disappearance oh, of Haruhi Suzumiya, cool. because the whole story there is that this world was changed somehow. We don't know who did it and why. They basically tell you why and you're, or who, and you're like, what? And then they then explain why. And it's done very succinctly, very concisely by the main protagonist. So it's more of their observation. So they don't have to actually show all the little things that happened. That is actually a very common thing in mystery stories in general. Yep. Kind of the whodunit kind of thing. Exactly. Especially if they want to give this antagonist Mm -hmm. actual depth. In a lot of those like pure, like Uh episodic kind of throwaway characters and stuff uh-huh. they won't bother with a with motivation yeah. or backstory or what have you. Right. Usually what'll happen is that it'll all be about how the person did it, not about why they did it. Right. Um, that's probably a great example of kind of where you could have had something like that in kind of a 
pseudo superhero cop kind of thing in the daredevil netflix first series with kingpin oh, having sure. a very good proper emotional backstory mm -hmm. that doesn't show necessarily how the person went from being who they were as an origin story to uh -huh. a kingpin but actually what brought them to this emotional place exactly. because the character's whole right uh, modus operandi yes. was based in emotion so right. it's just a very good way to do that as well what emotional place does the person have to be in in order to get to those warped conclusions right that's another way to cheat out the whole plot reasons of why is to make the emotional resonance with the story so strong mm -hmm. that you see how it broke the person how it right. altered the person how they were able to make that that leap unfortunately that does lead into just edgy tragic backstory for it the sake can. of edgy it tragic can. backstory but it doesn't have to but it doesn't have to yeah so yeah that being said guys mm -hmm. hope that helps you with your crafting of antagonist origin yes. stories or your appreciation of some let us know any questions you have about that and we'll answer them in the previous podcast in the next podcast right uh but yeah, yeah leave those in the comments mm -hmm. below now we're going to get into the q a section of the video yes the first question is from steel, steel ram. ram what is your favorite book series and one-off novel Ooh. and finally what's your favorite mythical creature but caleb but jacob, oh, jacob can't, can't take the phoenix ha <laughs> i'd say dragon if not the phoenix um. uh so my favorite book series it's kind of tough to say because I don't really read that many book series. Mm -hmm. I've, re I've read a lot of individual books. Okay. Uh, probably if I had to pick a favorite book series, it's hard to reread Lord of the Rings. Oh, but when yeah, I think but... about like the impact a series of books has ever had yeah. for me, Lord of the Rings is always going to win mm -hmm. because it shaped my desire to right. experience fantastical worlds and their their stories. Yeah, I'd have to I'd have to also say Lord of the Rings, but because that's like. I feel like that's so foundational. I'm going to pick a different one. Okay. I will say um, A Song of Ice and Fire. Oh, cool. Because that, that, was, that was the next, you know, sort of Lord of the Rings style thing for me. For sure. And one-off novel. Um, okay. <sighs> the one-off novel. Oh, there's Mine. some tough no. ones out there. Uh, because one of, the, one of the things with kind of one-off novels is mm. they, have, they have, like, specific things that they make you feel. And they're just trying to give you that experience, and you have it, and then it's right. it resonates with you kind of for forever. Oh, there's a couple like that that had kind of the sense of wonder, mm -hmm. but I'm still trying to think. Well, you go, if, you go if you have. Uh, one. This is more of a novella, like it's it's a really short, like 100 pages, but mm -hmm. uh, Man Alive by G.K. Chesterton, ah, all one yeah. word. That that's one of those ones that like it's not that great as far as novels go, but it was one of those ones that really just changed the way I thought about things in life in general um yeah I, love that one. I don't really have a i don't really have a good answer for this because a lot of the stories that are like one-off novels mm -hmm. they seem to be they seem to be like not favorites of mine but they all carry like something that i i really appreciate because they're not able to have about an ensemble them. casts well no not really but like they they carry each within them like very specific like very specific core sure. things well, in there. Like and the, also, the, where the red fern grows or you know or something where the like red that. fern grows was yeah that yeah that's why i watched the movie and stuff with the movie and dogs and um <laughs> i i do really like Twenty Thousand leagues under the sea i really oh. love the whole idea of exploring and okay. kind of discovering something new um you could talk about some of the big you know novels out there like 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 well like 451 fahrenheit or like yeah yeah or yeah or like war and peace you know <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, yes, <culture. laughs> yeah yeah um i'm gonna say actually Twenty Thousand leagues under the sea okay. it's not my favorite cool. i just know that that's a one right there that has a very unique special feeling to me gotcha. that I, I really appreciate cool. uh finally what's your favorite mythical creature well i really really love anything that can fly i've always been a huge yeah. fan of like eagles or like any kind of just winged creature so are you gonna pick the phoenix well, i'm gonna pick like glader from uh dragons basically no did i say glader yeah oh is that that's that's the the dragon uh -huh. right? i yeah. meant to say uh Gwehir. 
the the oh. eagle from uh, Lord oh, of the Rings. Yeah, yeah, okay. I love King the, the idea of a great eagle, like the idea yeah. of a massive winged yeah. creature that's so big mm-hmm. and so like intelligent and beyond kind of the right understanding of humans that it's almost got this warped philosophy in its head because it's so like separated from everything. Okay, I don't know. I I, I like I like the right. idea of Gwe here and the massive eagle. It's very simple, but yeah. Next question from Christian Magrum. Jacob, how did you decide how grounded the story for your book would be? Mm. Ooh, that was actually one of the first questions I had when I was like coming up with the idea for this story because uh-huh. that can cause a bit of dissonance if you don't have that planned out beforehand. Yeah. Um, but I basically said that I wanted it to be mostly like pseudo realistic apart from the armor because you know space armor but um, it's a sci-fi but it's a sci-fi so you know so like, it can't be as grounded as you yeah want it basically to be. i was like okay i want it to be more or less realistic like not go super crazy but i also don't want to be necessarily bound by the rules of reality so i'm like i'm just going to make my separate place cool you know okay uh, Anthea Giz Manita asks, how, uh, how do you be confident Ooh. in regards to socializing with other people and trying to step outside of your comfort zone? Whoa, that's great, a great question. question. Uh, I would say that we both came from backgrounds where we we were not very confident. Like, yeah. We've not... Hardcore like, introverts. Like, like hardcore introverts. And when we say introverts, we, 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 have to, we have to make a point here in that we're both still introverts. Right. Like... Mm-hmm. Introverts, introversion is how you get your energy. It has nothing to do with how right. sociable you are. I've mm-hmm. gotten a lot more sociable, and so has Jacob, like yeah. in the last few years. But one of the things that's really helped me become confident mm-hmm. is establishing a firm base in believing in myself outside yeah. of uh, environmental factors. And what mm-hmm. I mean by that is I had to basically almost write it down as to why I believe in myself. Sure. And it can't be based on what you do, Mm -hmm. what other people say, or what other people say you do. So, So, like, I can't be confident because oh, okay the reason why you can be confident in those things but i don't recommend it is because they will fail you right it's just, not something you can control right so the things that you can't control are the kind of things that allow you to be right. confident in a, in a very fun twist and thing exactly. so because it is a decision yeah um for me one of the things that helped a lot specifically with regards to socializing and all that stuff and stepping outside the comfort zone mm-hmm. was um actually working in customer service oh because um, i used to Okay, I, I'm a very expressive person on here, right? But I used to never smile. Like, like not with people I wasn't, like, comfortable with. So I would I would help customers and be like, hello, what's your name? All right, hi, what would you like? Here you go. It's this much. Thank you. Here's your change. It's Have true. a nice day. Literally, like that robot, total mm-hmm. robot. And uh, my boss was amazing, and he'd just be like, smile. And I'd just be like, stop it. Like, that. stop it. Um, but well, we, had, we had a really good first boss. We had an amazing uh, when first we, boss. When we worked at our summer job. Yeah. Um, so but that was how I kind of came out of my show. Yeah, it, it's it's repetition. I, I would say mm-hmm. that whatever you're doing, make sure you're you're doing the right stuff there. But I, I would say, um, really work on yourself and really try to separate the idea of other people's other forces outside dictating mm-hmm. what happens internally for you. Assume they're thinking positive stuff about you. Yeah, there's a lot of it you that uh, comes with just generally shifting to a positive mindset. That's a long, arduous process. Yes. I think it took me about six years to do that, <laughs> of intentionally trying to right. do that. So and, that's, and you still have to in the moment. And you still have to do it like every, like, every yeah. like, like right, like every other day. Like you have to work on it. So uh, TB also a long, a uh, long time ago, you talked a bit about quiet characters, and I was wondering who's your favorite quiet character and what do you think they can do? We know what his story. is. Well, Yuk Nagato. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I almost say that's kind of cheating because they're a robot, but yeah. Well, you almost have the perfect example of that because they're a they're robot. A robot and yeah. the perfect quiet and, and their whole character arc focuses around that whole notion. Yeah. Right. I don't really have a favorite quiet character because I don't consider quiet to be a a character trait even. Gotcha. One of the things that I'll go into is uh, if the character is just quiet. Mm-hmm. like if quiet is a trait that doesn't like it's like oh they're just a quiet character i'm like i, I can't really right. identify i need, with I need them. more than that yeah right so like what i Yamaguchi or what i what i look for kind of but i, I would say almost sakishim is a better example of a quiet sure. character okay um but the reason is because the quiet characters are ones that are essentially wearing a mask and the mask is that they sure. 
aren't expressive, which means mm-hmm. that they are holding in expression right. intentionally. Yeah. So what I look for are the characters that have not qu- a quiet tag attached to them, but the mm-hmm. subdued tag. Oh. So the characters, um, in a lot of ways, actually, that are the old ancient ones, the ones mm. that have okay. this like uh, this almost unearthly nature to them, where they are quiet, mm-hmm. but if brought to a place of where they need to express, they will. I appreciate those characters a lot. In a lot of ways, I would say Iro is a quiet character. Um, when okay. you see him, you know, acting and stuff, he is a very soft peaceful so i look for that calm peaceful thing gotcha but it's not that's not just their shtick right well yeah yeah don't in order for them to be a full fully fleshed out character that it needs to be more than just a shtick but yeah yeah um and as for what they contribute in the story he already said it and Mm -hmm. for you can not from haruhi if you haven't seen that watch it but it's a it's pretty self uh self-explanatory once you see the disappearance right Right. Um, Dutch Nintendo asks, uh, I live in the Netherlands, and would the book be also av- also be avail- available there? Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, <laughs> for um, uh, for all information on the book and stuff, uh, go to the link in the description for our website. There's a big, like, front page thing on there where you can get uh, uh, sub- send your email to us for the newsletter. Yes. And that's where all the information will be in one, like, concise place. We'll still put it out on here, but that's just the best spot. Yeah. But for all international stuff... I don't know how that works yet. Exactly. So, so we'll figure it out. Stay posted. This is, you were know. you also inspired by the Fullmetal Alchemist Brotherhood War of Ishval for the story? I love how they did that. Um, as far as like specific like tie-ins necessarily. Yeah, like FMAB was a huge inspiration overall. He's asking, was the War um, of Ishval inspi- inspiration for you for your book? Not specifically. Okay, cool. Uh, next question is from Benny Dellen. Uh, will the book be available for Kindle? Th- that's the plan, but, you know, get on that newsletter. Yep. Marcus Markison asks, what is your schedule for watching anime? Like, watch Hunter x Hunter on Sunday, upload it on Tuesday. Uh, We record on weekdays. Yep. Um, We are generally uh, recording, um, like, around a week ahead. So, that's it. Uh, Lex the Graceful Rival asks, uh, you referenced Giga, Glee and Lee, and Philip DeFranco in your videos before. So, that got me wondering, what other YouTubers do you watch? Anime YouTuber and non-anime YouTubers. Um, Prozidi. Prozidi. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, unique name Saurus. He's, he's got I like Unique name Saurus. I have to be careful when I'm yeah, going can... out there watching anime YouTubers, so I don't actually watch right. that many anime YouTubers in yeah, general. Yeah, me neither. Um, I used to watch Glass Reflection a lot. But... I watch a lot of reaction uh, okay. channels. Blind Wave. Yeah. Um, I would say there's a lot of reaction channels, but one of the things is that I don't actually spend that much time watching YouTube videos. Like, in general so it it tends to be more of a thing of like i want to interact with people primarily more through like twitter and stuff so i love interacting with people on their discords uh interacting with people Mm -hmm. in the dms through twitter and stuff um so other youtubers this is more of a twitch thing but they do post into youtube too but uh critical role oh yeah you follow critical role that's That's critical role yeah uh, another question from Lex the Graceful Rival. Uh, in your view, what separates edgy and dark stories and characters? Uh, what takes an edgy character over the threshold to the dark characters category? And what prevents stories from being dark and just edgy? Okay, gotcha. so this is a lot of questions. So the first thing, what separates edgy and dark stories? Um, so when you say edgy, one of the things that we, we look at when you say, we say edgy is you think about the teen with like... Mm-hmm. Like, you think of kind of Jotaro's kind of character design. Right. He's got yeah. like, he's he, posturing. He personifies the whole idea of Edge in a very intentional way. And right. it's amazing. Well, I'd say Edgy is a thing that has like a lot of different definitions to it. But on the one hand, on like the protagonist side, it's basically someone to trying to seem more intense than they right. actually are. And it ends up just being kind of funny. Right. And on the or other character. side with Edgy is where... I would say the dark side is what you're talking mm-hmm. about here. There was uh, an anime that we watched the first episode of and just laughed because right. it was intentionally trying to be so edgy. So, yeah, yeah. Right. Or dark, as you right. would say. But it ended up just being edgy, and it's like, wow, I don't think the human body has that much blood. But, right, right. You know. So, uh, And I would say the reason for that is because it the, usually it's because they lack emotional grounding. Yeah, like, they're, they're, that's probably the, the best reason. I was saying it's, it was all going to be character-focused, but mm-hmm. emotional grounding like for the characters involved in right. the story is the main thing. Yeah, like, that's why Zuko 
is an edgy teen in the beginning of the right, story exactly. in book one, but by at mm-hmm. least like halfway into book two, you're like, right. oh, oh no, this is, yeah, this is and even this is not edge. Right, this is like kid level dark kind exactly. of uh, and, character. And stuff you even going see on. the that the traces of that stuff earlier on in season one. You and do. the reason is because while for most of season one he is basically his emotions are categorized to that one angsty right. angry kind of emotion yeah. it doesn't stay there there are the parts where he goes to stuff you know beyond that yeah. caring about his uncle and such yeah so emotional grounding is really what you want to look for here um when we think of like dark characters one of the things that's really weird kind of in, just in my mind with dark characters in particular is they still have to be characters right when i think exactly. of truly dark characters I think of something that's like evil for the sake of evil, like some kind of pure malevolent force of darkness, right. like in Star Wars, like the mm-hmm. Emperor Palpatine character. Like, yeah, exactly. That's a dark character, yeah. but there's nothing about them that's emotionally grounded. Exactly. In fact, they are almost there as a shadow to prove the sunshine, if you will, to quote some song right. lyrics there, um, with uh, the the protagonist. Right. So. The, the real thing is just how much emotional depth do you want to give mm. to your characters. Yeah. Edgy is where you make them pretend like they have depth. Like, oh, I'm so deep. Right. Oh, you don't understand me. Exactly. That's where we think about those villains that are like, oh, they're misunderstood. <laughs> right. Well, no, that just that just is based on whether or not the audience thinks they're attractive. Oh, but, oh, uh, oh, shots fired. Okay, but, all right. Um, one example I would say that is more in the middle where some people think they're just edgy and some people think they're actually like, you know, deep and just characters in a dark setting would be uh, Subaru from ReZero. Oh, sure. Because, because it is very much categorized to just one basic kind of emotion a lot of the time, mm-hmm. dying and suffering, right? Right. But there are the parts that aren't that and the reasons for that seem to be an, a perpetuated thing in the plot so you're like well it kind of makes sense you know and right so yeah okay cool uh also question from lex the graceful rival oh uh tldr oh, okay so uh um they, they had a long description and basically they're talking about the types of characters that are very emotionally aware to the point where they're able to read into the motivations of the other characters oh. better than the characters themselves and they're talking about how a lot of times that can basically be the author's way of expositing uh, but sure. like how those characters kind of fit into the story so how do you prevent the audience from developing distaste for such characters and what's your preferred way of writing a self-aware character and then any examples of good ones uh oh maybe the joker okay the joker yeah. is a decent example of that um yeah the thing about the joker is that his whole thing is that he tries to he tries to keep himself from being understood intentionally, and he's aware of how crazy he is. Sure. So he plays up it. Mm-hmm. But the thing also with the Joker is that you have so many iterations of the character. Right. That you have to look kind of for your favorite ones, and some of the best ones with like Mark Hamill or Heath Ledger mm-hmm. uh, end up having the self-awareness of their own craziness. But the way that they care so much about what they do and who they are as a Mm -hmm. character makes the audience care about them basically you can always tell when a character will get audience kind of you know fan favorite kind of stamp Uh seal of approval if the character cares about themselves a lot or their own story if the character cares about their own story it's not a fourth wall breaking thing it's basically saying um like the it's the passion. idea of like being assertive and stuff like that. Or, or just being passionate about their own right. story or motivations or what have you. The yeah. audience will at some level mm-hmm. appreciate that. Uh, um, so that yeah. that's a that's a great way to put it. My specific examples would be, uh, well, yeah, Ami from Toradora. I'd say she's like one of the best examples of this ever, especially okay. since that's a story that specifically deals with the emotional states of its characters. Gotcha. Um, and the and they make you they make it so that the audience doesn't like this character mm-hmm. and they embrace that and then they say okay now let's make it so that down the road they actually start to like them a bit more with time yeah um another one of those is uh ueno from a silent voice oh, they are man. very upfront at making sure that you hate her i hated her you hate her yep 
But at the same time, you kind of come to understand I still her. hated her. You still hate her. <laughs> like, like, yeah. but, but the minute you said, oh, you know, I, I like twitched a little inside. I was just like, hmm, right. And, and That character exists. And even if you hate them, that's an emotion that you strongly feel towards them. Mm-hmm. So that can be a really good thing for their character in the story. Gotcha. Yep, good stuff, good stuff. Uh, Rage's Legend asks, will Battle Lines get an audiobook? Shout out the antagonist ascendancy. Uh, hey. Yeah. Even um, though it's over, but right, yeah, right, good, yeah. good shout out. And, and they won. That's um, true. But uh, yes, that is definitely a plan. I have some plans in my He has plans for the plans. plan. Yeah, yes. for the audiobook. But uh, get on the newsletter to you know, learn oh, more about that as fast Nick as possible. 2273 asks, did you get any infer- inspiration from Caleb? Did you get inspiration from me? <laughs> um, Yes, absolutely. Like what we was like it? well well okay. So we talk about stories all the time, right? So uh-huh. we're constantly like we inspire each other all the time, right? But as far as That's like true. specific things of like did I base a character off Caleb or you know or something like that? Probably I didn't not. do anything like that. But um, like but, but, but like absolutely, story yes. story inspiration. Uh yes. Cool. Uh, yeah, cool. especially with like I know how much you like ensemble casts of characters and stuff and it's like okay, yeah. It helps me get an appreciation for those kinds of things. Little Duck asks, is there ever a point in the creative process where you believe the project can no longer be salvaged and needs to be scrapped? Ooh. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes, Absolutely. definitely. Absolutely. One of the things that I generally see as the easiest thing to scrap are um, basically the uh, the kind of, the not the foundational points, but basically the environmental things that limit the potential of the the project Mm -hmm. so and a great example would be a character i'm designing a character and i'm pigeonholing them into a fantasy story Mm -hmm. so i make all these things that are fantasy only sure i can just scrap that whole part of the process essentially the whole character Mm -hmm. and make the character be one that's more of a this can fit into any environment sure i think that's a great way to uh do that now there are examples of where you go too far into this and that's where the whole thing needs to be scrapped i think that's kind of what you're Mm -hmm. talking about here um but also if you're creating a story and the story itself you don't actually have the like you don't actually have the vision in of the story inside you anymore like it actually dies like then then yes i'd say you could scrap it but it's really hard to do that so if anything the definition of scrapping also seems to be a little bit vague. Mm-hmm. So maybe what it is is put it on hold, throw it into a you know a deep folder somewhere, revisit it in three years, and maybe you'll have some new inspiration for it. Um, but yeah, what I would say is that um, so scrapping stories can be very helpful because uh, you can work on a story and you can work on it for three years, and that's great. Those that time that you spent working on it is improving yes. your ability to write. Exactly, but because of that, right, there might be a point where you're like, you know what, I could come up with a better story now because when I came up with this, that was, you know, six years ago or whenever, and I could come up with something much better right now because yeah. simplicity is what takes things from being good to being amazing. Yeah. So keeping things simple is very important. And if you're, you know, getting something like you talked about things just going off the rails, yeah. right, um, that is actually one of the signs where I would say, yeah, you, you might need to scrap it. But at the same time, pushing forward through and getting that, say, first draft done is, I cannot stress enough how helpful that can be, even if you scrap the story right after. Yeah, the follow-up question with that was, or should you just press on to trying to fix it, no matter how off the rails you right. get? I would say, generally, uh, no. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say fixing a story is something you should do when the story's done. And if right. you are not able to finish the story... Mm-hmm. then there's almost no point to do that so yeah turn um, off that internal editor and yep. just get it done get and it then done. afterwards evaluate whether you should scrap it or not right yeah. uh wait what's this for asks what would be the most challenging theme for you to tackle in writing hashtag shonen junkies hey shonen junkies um the, the most challenging theme out there uh something that i have no grounding for maybe like well, yeah, that's probably what it is. Just something you're not familiar with. Yeah, something I'm not familiar yeah. with. But I'm, I'm trying to think of, like, the most, like, not familiar thing to me. Becoming a woman. <laughs> Growing into a woman. I I have no grounding for that or anything like that. So that, sure. that, that would be a very tough one for me to write. And I am actually, as a guy, I'm totally willing to say this. I am scared of writing 
female characters a little bit oh, because gotcha. I don't understand women as much as I understand guys. So sure. I, I think that that's maybe a, maybe a little bit of maybe societal sexism just built into my head thinking that they're so different from each other. Sure. But I think that would be really challenging for me. Gotcha. Um, I have no idea from you myself. I, I feel like the thing that would be hardest for me is something that I wouldn't know enough. I would so not know anything about it that I wouldn't even be able to tell you what it is. <laughs> right. You yeah. wouldn't know how challenging it is because you wouldn't know where you're failing. Either. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Ethereal Reader asks, uh, what are some of the more subtle moments you appreciate in Ooh. Hunter Hunter? The relationship between, between Gone and Killua. Yeah. Everything in that is yep, extremely yep, yep. subtle mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's extremely it's, good. And, and like it's... It's subtle, but they also are very clear about telling you when they're when they're developing it. You know, my favorite car my favorite episode still is, is the, the, the campfire beach episode. No, it's a campfire. No, I know, but it's on the beach. No, right? it's I think it's on a cliffside. Oh, really? Yeah. I thought it was on the beach. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Oh. Anyway, yeah. Uh, that I just wanted to be able to sneak you into saying that your favorite episode was a beach episode. Can't do it. Um, yeah, there's a lot yeah. of other subtle things in the show, but that's definitely my favorite. Uh, the stuff that they had with, um, a lot of the stuff that they had with the Phantom Troop about them caring like about each other, specifically when they died and stuff, that was handled really well. Sure. Uh, Corel Squay asks, which of the anime you've reacted to, are reacting to, or seen before the channel started, has the most visually appealing aesthetics on a subjective level, not an objective one? Well, that's a great question, but uh, just to be fair, I don't have an objective thing in my body at all. Like... I think, like, one of the things I'm like, easiest to throw out there is, like, I, I don't have, like, any, like, objective whatever. I mean, well, I... Yeah, I think what they might be saying is, like, okay, let's say, like, we really liked the art style of, say, Soul Eater, right? And we might say, like, okay, that's not, like, you know, it doesn't hold up to, say, your name, right? But, sure, but, sure, okay. You know, we still, like, okay. loved it or something like that. Um, Place for the Universe. I'm just going to steal that one. Because it's just recent and stuff. Well, yeah. And I, I love how they do, like, the highlighting with, like, the white on, like, the hair or whatever. You know, things like that. And, of course, it's not bad either. Like, uh, yeah. I almost want to do one of the ones that stylized, like, the style is something that I just find appealing. Okay. Like, if I had to choose one... Like Konosuba? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> oh, dang. That's really tough. Because the visual kind of aesthetic mm -hmm. is something that's hard to separate from me from sound. Now, this is a weird thing to say. But, oh. like, the audio-visual experience is kind hmm. of what makes anime something special to me. Hmm. I can't really separate Fate Stay night unlimited blade works is fights in the visual aesthetic from the sounds of everything right. happening uh -huh. i can't separate a silent voices visuals okay from yeah. all the sounds going on in the background yeah uh, i can't separate your name's visuals from all the silent voice. i knew you would do that yeah, yeah. so <laughs> for me i yeah. have a really hard time with this this answer mm -hmm. because i don't really have a visual aesthetic kind of rating system mm -hmm. or even like just the one that I like like here's one that was really good that wasn't like uh like objectively mind blowing like a silent voice or something um in this corner of the world that one in that one did some really cool stuff with like the movie. like drawings and stuff yeah 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 oh um, man see mm, that's really Cowboy tough Bebop or no oh, man the ending of uh evangelion yeah, that, that's, that's totally it. No, um, I, I gotta say, oh man, in a lot of ways, this is just an unfair question for me. Gotcha. I, I'm not going to be able to answer this well. I'm not going to be able to really honestly give you an opinion, even because with with this, it's not something I really think about like almost at all. And in terms of just you know just you know yeah what's your opinion what's the one that kind of stands out to you i i, I don't i don't know like mm -hmm. I, I i so separated in that mind but it says and has that influenced your enjoyment of the show in a significant way please explain what it is that you find the most appealing okay okay so you're talking yeah. about specifically within the visual aesthetic um, so okay i can i can answer okay i can answer all right i can answer finally 
So this is a weird one, but I really loved Made in Abyss's oh. visual aesthetic. Now, yeah. here's the yeah. thing. That was a good one. The the use of, I would say, almost like painted kind of watercolor, mm. blurred, not hard line. Like there weren't as many hard lines yeah. in. Um, Especially with the backgrounds, yeah. Yes. And with the backgrounds and all that other stuff, it's really kind of a, a question of how they manipulate lighting, I would say. Sure. So it's kind of the scenery design aspect. You're saying like ex- example, mm. like animation, color palette, art style, scenery design. I really, really get wrapped up in the visual medium being used to convey the world by whatever's going on in the background. Gotcha. That's why in a lot of ways, Maiden Abyss's character models, so I just, you know, I don't care, mm-hmm. cool. But the everything else going yeah. on in the background and stuff, all the creatures, all that other stuff. It had a very Ghibli feel to it. It had a very Ghibli feel to it, but it gave also this unsettling, almost strangulating feeling when you would encounter oh, well, yeah. the monsters <laughs> right. and the strange things going mm-hmm. on because your your feeling goes to, I don't know I don't understand what this is in mm-hmm. front of me, but it gives me this uneasy feeling. Sure. So I love that. And also how weird things got visually going further down. Gotcha. So uh, Maiden Abyss is probably my my answer. As for why I liked the silent voice so much, it was because they went into so much detail with the characters. Yeah. And in showing that there was always something happening. There was very rarely that there would be a part of a character that was not moving in some way. <laughs> So you're really all about the animation. The animation. And because they were able to do that, they were able to make it so that even if there wasn't something that we were concretely picking up from the character and how they were thinking or feeling because of how they were animated, there was always something there. It was never really static. Yeah. Silent Voice's character animation is (laughs) oh so good. That's one of those ones where it almost doesn't answer the question because you said in a subjective and not objective way. Yeah. But... Yeah. yeah, Squeaky Narwhal. Hey, from the Discord. Question: Is there a certain character type that you really enjoy but don't see much of, and therefore wish showed up more often in media? Ooh. Love from the Waifu Warriors. Hey, um, a certain character type that you really enjoy. The Sundere Grandpa. Yeah, that's a good one. Like it does show that's up. A good one. You know, a fair amount of the time. But I do like that. But Sundere Grandpas like are always always nice. I also really like the really really young kind of plucky character so Mm -hmm. when i say plucky i mean like you know how kota in my hero academia has this chip on his shoulder and he's just kind of angry and stuff Mm -hmm. if you took that but made it like exceptionally spunky like really spunky but made them really young i'm talking like like maiden abyss like no 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 like like seven years old like like a little kid but showing a character with all the spunk and the like, mm-hmm. like kind of that fiery kind of haha, and they say extremely simple dialogue, mm-hmm. but it's the kind of thing where you're like, I would hope so. They're seven. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. But they sound like, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute, like, where did you come up with that? Like that gotcha. kind of stuff. I, okay. I love that character because it makes the audience kind of question like, like it makes them question the the simple things. Okay. So nice. It, you know how a kid will sometimes just go, but why? But why? Over and over and over again. But why? That's like the four year old. Mm-hmm. The seven year old is just at that point where they're able to gotcha. use some critical thinking. They're able to kind of intuit some things. But if you get one that's really expressive and very stubborn, mm-hmm. and that stubborn expressiveness, it's kind of the good side of a Bakugo character. Okay. I, I want to see more of that. And I gotcha. think the only reason why there are not that many like that is because it's hard to write dialogue for really young yes. kids. It's exceptionally hard. It is very I don't difficult. even try. It's stupid yeah. hard. Uh, Cornship Universe, last Final question. Final question, yeah. Who is your favorite homunculus from Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood? Greed. Greed Ling. Greed Ling, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Jacob, do you have any ideas for any book you might make in the future? Yes. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> All right, guys, that was an awesome Q&A. <laughs> and uh, thank you for submitting your questions. Mm-hmm. If you want to give us uh, any more questions, put them in the comments down below. Yeah. And they'll probably get answered in the next podcast video. If your question didn't get answered in this one, just put Sorry. it in again. There's or, a lot of questions. Or, yeah, or try and phrase it a little bit differently. A lot of the questions that we don't really answer are things like, what are you going to watch next? Right, those we just generally um, kind of ignore because those are there are so many of those. But, yeah, 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 yeah. But, yeah, 
Uh, we'll see you in our future podcast. Mm-hmm. But until then, we're Semblance of Sanity. I'm Caleb. I'm Jacob. And we'll see you all next time. time.